really a privilege for me to have the possibility to introduce Professor Tom Firm as our keynote and first speakers for the day. I have to admit that it's even like somehow intimidating and strange for me because I started quite recently to work on these topics while I recently read an interview by Professor Firm. I hope it's not a fake news here, but where he stated that he was working on chemometrics before it was called chemometrics even. So obviously I was more than happy when he agreed to give a talk to our workshop. I'll try to keep his, I'll try to keep his introduction brief and short, even if it's difficult, if you give a look at his CV. Tom is professor of applied stats at the University College in London. Prior to that, he also worked as a statistician for four years for a baking research association. He gave an invaluable contribution to the field as he built a vast network of collaborators and he published a huge number of papers, both from an applied side, I would say, and from a statistical, more methodological standpoint, in my opinion. He wrote also books such as, for example, Practical NIR Spectroscopy with Application in Food and beverage analysis, and then did a lot of work on food analysis. But his work is way broader than that, especially with near infrared spectroscopy. And it covers different areas, as for example, degradation of historical papers, detection of fraudulent medicines, and so on and so forth. He won the Thomas Searchfield Award in 2001 for his contribution to the NIR framework, and is the president of International Committee for Near Infrared Spectroscopy. Uh, I really would be able to say even more about his experiences, his works, but I'll stop here and I'll leave the floor to him. He is going to give a presentation today entitled NIR in Food Analysis, some history, some thoughts on the current state and some tentative prediction. So please, Tom, you have more or less one hour and 15 minutes, including question, and you can handle it as you prefer. So please, thank you. Okay, th thanks very much for the embarrassing introduction. Um, <laughs> So the, let me first see if I can manage the technology and share my screen. Okay, and... Okay, so can somebody confirm you can actually see slide number one? Yep, yep, perfect. Great, thanks, and is the sound okay? Okay, so I've I've got the there's there's loads of time, and I have totally misjudged this. There'll be plenty of time for questions at, at the end, um, and I keep on totally misjudging Zoom uh, classes when it comes to teaching. Um, but if you want to, if there are things that aren't clear or or things you'd like me to expand on a bit, I've got the chat open. Feel feel free to put something in the chat. Uh, I'll try and keep half an eye on it uh, and. I might just leave some things to the end or I may, may respond if it seems uh, appropriate. So this is the sort of title one uh, dreams up ages in advance when asked to present and um, le leaving yourself plenty of scope. But in fact, I will pretty well stick to this. So I will talk a bit about the uh, history of uh, NIR in food analysis, uh, which I'm old enough to remember some of and which I suspect most of you aren't. Uh, and say a few things about where we are and where we're going. I think I think the where we're going, you might you might see some flashes of grumpy old man in it, but uh, the, there are things I don't like about what's happening at the moment. But we'll get to that later. Okay, so here here's where it started. Um, actually, it's a bit pretentious to say NIR started with food. NIR has been around for a lot longer than we have. Um, what I mean is the the use of NIR spectroscopy for quantitative measurements uh, started with food. Uh, and it started with the guy in the picture who's, uh, I hope you've all heard of, a guy called Carl Norris, uh, who was an engineer who worked for the United States Department of Agriculture in, in Beltsville, Washington, uh, and who died recently. Well, yes, it's two years ago now, but. Um, who died relatively recently at a fairly ripe old age. And this picture was taken in 82, but when I guess we were, he was in his 60s by then. Um, and it shows his lab. And it shows some of the instruments that he started working with. And, and basically, he was an engineer. He built some of these. So it's a, a Carey 14 spectrophotometer modified by Carl. Uh, to 
uh, try and do quantitative NIR. And the first things that he worked on uh, were food. So, well, USDA, not, not a surprise really. Um, he worked on, the first application was moisture. Um, and maybe that's not surprising. Moisture is probably the easiest thing after particle size uh, that you can measure with near infrared because water's got some very big absorbance peaks. Uh, and he start in, in, it was ground grains, ground wheat, uh, ground other things as well, I think, and, and soya beans. And he started by doing transmission. So he made the early samples, the early measurements were taken by uh, making, by grinding the grains or the beans, uh, dissolving them or more or less dissolving them in carbon tetrachloride uh, and using uh, transmission through a, a fairly thin sample. Uh, and later on, he discovered that you didn't even have, you didn't have to use a solvent. Uh, you could actually do reflectant spectroscopy off a, directly off a ground sample. Um, and clearly one of the motivations for that was that carbon tetrachloride is a rather nasty chemical. It's a carcinogen. Um, it's very volatile. It's a really nasty um, chemical to work with. And so if you, you can, if you can avoid making solutions in, in really rather nasty solvents, uh, it's not only saves time and saves um, environmental considerations of having to chuck the stuff away later, uh, but also um, it's a lot quicker and easier uh, and a lot safer. So he developed calibrations early on for moisture, protein, oil in things like grains and soybeans. And that's, that's where it started um, in, in Washington in the 1960s. And he had to calibrate because uh, NIR is an indirect measurement. We'd like to measure the amount of water that's in our ground wheat. Uh, and what we're actually measuring is the absorbance of energy by, uh, oxygen, by OH bonds, hydrogen oxygen bonds uh, in the water, in the wheat. Uh, and so you need to calibrate. And I imagine you all know what the calibration experiment is, but for for completeness, you take a set of samples and you measure by the reference method, the moisture content, protein content, whatever those samples, uh, and you collect some near infrared data. It might be reflect absorbance at one or two wavelengths. Uh, it might be a whole spectrum. And then you use some sort of algorithm to produce a, a rule, a prediction formula that will predict the reference measurement from the and our the, the spectroscopic data. And that, that's what Chemometrics is all about, basically. Chemometrics sort of started with that problem. Uh, and what Norris did to start with was um, really very simple. So it was what was so-called delta OD, delta optical density. Uh, it One wavelength won't do, uh, and that's because other things interfere with the with the absorbances of the things that you're trying to measure, uh, not least particle size when you're when you're measuring on a, a ground sample directly. Uh, but for some things, um, you can two wavelengths will do, uh, and for some things, all you have to do is take the difference of the absorbance at two different wavelengths, and that gives you what was called delta OD. And Norris's first calibrations look very much like the sort of calibrations that any analytical chemist would do. Um, you plot the reference measurement against a single rapid measurement uh, and you fit a straight line to it and you use that straight line to do the prediction. Uh, and that worked reasonably well for moisture. Moisture is very easy to do. When he started doing um, more complicated things, things with smaller peaks, things with peaks that are more overlapped by other things, then he generalized that to linear equations in um, sev with several terms uh, or with one term, but with one term, which was um, a more complicated function of the spectral data. 
Uh, and he used, when he got several terms, he used multiple linear MLRs, multiple linear regression to do the fitting. Uh, and basically that's where Kerometrics starts. Uh, it's, it's sort of like, this is where the wheel got invented uh, and all the rest is just um, building more, more and more, all the rest of Kerometrics is just bring, building more and more fancy vehicles using those wheels. Um, it, it's, it's the crucial step. It's, it's the step of realizing that um, you, you can get perfectly good quantitative calibrations out of NIR, despite the fact that the spectra look horrible, the spectra are the sort of things that um, Pucker spectroscopists shied away from because you don't, you don't get very clear assignments very often. You don't get sharply separated peaks. Uh, you get a whole mess of loads and loads of overlapping peaks, plus a load of interference from physical effects of the sample, like, like the particle size, like the colour. Um, so it's really messy, um, but it was Carl Norris who discovered that actually you can get the signal out of this mess in a relatively simple way in a lot of applications. Uh, in interestingly, his... Um, Equations aren't as simple as they seem. So he would use linear equations with often only one or two terms, but each one of those terms would typically be a ratio uh, of measurements at different wavelengths. So he'd have a simple um, reference equals A plus B times spectral data, but the spectral data would be a ratio of derivative measurements typically at two different wavelengths and often the um the the bandwidth of the the filter you use to take the derivative would vary top and bottom uh, and when it got more complicated with with multiple uh, multiple terms in the equation um then there might be uh, all sorts of different bandwidths, all sorts of different windows uh, for calculating the derivatives uh, and maybe two terms of ratios of, of first derivatives of, of involving four different wavelengths. So they're, they're more complicated than they seem. Um, and in fact, although Carl did have um, certainly later on, I'm not sure right at the beginning, software that would um, search for search across wavelengths for, for good combinations. It was software that he interacted with a lot. I've, I watched him do it in, in a demonstration and you would start picking the next wavelength that the software would run and it would it would suggest this wavelength and Carl would say, well, I, I don't like that one because of X, Y, Z, uh, and I'm going to take the second best one and so on. So there was a, there was a lot of Carl uh, in these uh, equations, a, a lot of interaction with somebody who knew a lot about the spectroscopy. I was certainly going to say something else there, but I can't. Oh, yes, I was going to make one other comment, which is um, we we typically use log one over R for um, the the spectral, the, the sort of bog standard spectral variable, uh, which we call absorbance. Log, log, it's not really log one over R, it's log reflectance of the standard over reflectance of the sample. Uh, and essentially, the f we we could use other things, we could use R, uh, and in fact, I've tried using R and it works um, pretty well, pretty much just as good. We use log one over R because Carl started with transmission. Um, and when you're doing transmission, there's some, there's Beer's law, which says that the um, log one over transmission uh, is proportional to the concentration, as long as the solution's uh, not too, the concentration in the solution is not too high. And Carl had built his, built his equipment with a, with a detector underneath with a logarithmic uh, amplifier. Uh, and when he built his reflectance instrument, he just took the detector from underneath and put it on top. And so you get a log one over R amplifier built into the hardware. 
And so he used log one over R and it worked until so we've gone on doing that. But it, it's sort of, it's weird how some of these historical things happen and, and they get built into the way we do things. I, if, try using R, it'll work just about as well. Um, okay, so that, that's Carl and, and that's where we start. Uh, and all of us who are doing quantitative NIR spectroscopy these days owe an enormous debt to Carl, uh, who, who was a really nice guy. Uh, there used to be a, a the um, International Diffuse Reflectance Conference in Chambersburg, which happens every two years. Uh, there used to be what's called a shootout, where lots of people analyse um, the same data set. Uh, and it was really amusing to watch as the, all the machine learning stuff came in and you would get these enthusiastic young people getting up and presenting analyses, which is really quite sophisticated methodology uh, and getting a certain result. And then Carl would stand up and he would have a, a one term equation with ratio of two derivatives and he would beat them hollow. Uh, and in the end, he was such a nice guy that he stopped competing so that somebody else could win. But I, I took a lesson from that. Um, often you don't need complicated methods uh, to do these things. So Carl's work, continuing the history lesson, Carl's work inspired, and, and the demand from, from Food and Ag, um, inspired uh, commercial companies to market uh, the first instruments. And these were, the early ones were filter instruments, uh, typically with, the early ones had half a dozen um, interference filters with wavelengths chosen, chosen by Carl effectively, uh, because they work quite well for things like moisture, protein, fat. Uh, and the first one, and one of the companies was Technicon. You can just about read Technicon on, oh, well, it's, it's in the text there, but you can just about read it on the front of that machine. Uh, the Dickie John was another company. Uh, um, Near Tech was another one. And they were all producing instruments that would measure in particular things like moisture and protein in, in grain, because that was a really important application because wheat was traded on moisture and protein and doing the measurements in the lab was A, slow and B, expensive. Uh, and when, when I left university and got a, a proper job in 1978, uh, I went to an outfit called the Flour Milling and Baking Research Association, uh, which does what it says on the tin. It did, it did research on um, milling, wheat milling and uh, baking using wheat flour. So cakes, bread, biscuits, things, nice things like that. There were some freebies around. Um, and one of the things they had in the analytical chemistry lab uh, was a Technicon Infralyzer 2.5. And that had six interference filters. It looked a bit like the box on the right. I, I struggled last week to try and find a photo of a Technicon Infralyzer 2.5, but I couldn't. Uh, the problem is that it's much easier to find photos of things that have been around since the internet than it is to find photos of things that were around before the internet. Um, the, well, I guess people just weren't taking photos and putting them up on the internet in those days. Um, and I think they'd had that for about two years. So I think they came out in about 76 or so. And it was being used to measure moisture and protein uh, in ground wheat, uh, ground wheat, wheat flour, uh, and later on uh, some other applications. But the this, it was a sort of workhorse for, for, the, for those measurements. Uh, the oldest picture I could find was that's a Technicon 400. Uh, it's a descendant of the Infralyzer 2.5 and it's got 19 filters in it. Uh, so they were, well, the instruments improved in many ways. In, in, the, in, in the Infralyzer 2.5, after you'd done the calibration, uh, you put the calibration in with a screwdriver on potentiometers. You turn them until you've got a number on the screen. Um, the, it got rather re, got rather uh, did more digitized later on, uh, but the idea of putting more filters in was to make them work with more applications. So how did we calibrate those? Uh, that was MLR because that's that's what Carl had done, but it was not using uh, fancy ratios and derivatives and things. It was just using uh, what I've called absorbances here, which are log one over r which is why I've used an L for it. 
uh, and multiple regression. So set of samples, reference, reference measurement on each one, um, log one over R at each filter wavelength, and you fit a multiple regression equation. Uh, and typically in those days, we would have calibration training sets of size about 30 to 40, uh, which was by modern day standards, that would be pretty small. Um, and obviously multiple regression works all right when you've got um, 30 or 40 observations and only six predictors. Uh, but even then, um, one, of, one of the problems with as anybody who's worked with it will know, uh, with NIR data, is that there is there are very strong correlations between the absorbances at different wavelengths, um, and particularly if you're doing reflectance spectroscopy, where the, the surface, the particle size, the texture of the sample will cause the whole spectrum to move up and down and induce very, very strong correlations. So even when P, the number of variables, was only six, um, it was still the the equations using all six were somewhat unstable numerically, uh, and it was worth reducing the number of predictors um, stepwise regression in preferably backwards, um, and and two or three filters would do for most applications. You could do moisture with two, protein with three. Um, when one got to ninety, the nineteen filter instruments appeared. Um, you tried sticking data from 19 filters into a multiple regression, the correlations were the, 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 the matrix you have to invert to do multiple regression was so unstable that uh, good software would say, I can't do this, and bad software would produce, of which there was plenty around, where it would produce complete rubbish with um, negative F tests for including variables and things like that. Um, so, the, the the difficulty of handling NIR data because of the dimensionality was already there uh, when there were only 19 filters. Uh, but of course it got worse, it got a lot worse. So these things appeared um, and they appeared whilst I was at Chorleywood, they probably appeared in the early 1980s. Um, and I did manage to find a photograph of this, which I stole from somewhere, and I hope Pierre's not in the audience. It's not out of the question. Um, so this is a photo of um, one of the first commercial monochromators that, that appeared, Neotech 6350. Uh, and that used a diffraction grating to measure a whole spectrum. Uh, the, the actual monochromators, the box in the corner against the wall, uh, the nearer box is the uh, display of the computer. It's a cathode ray tube. Uh, we're, we're that far back. Um, and the computer was absolutely horrid. Uh, it, was, it had an eight inch floppy disk, which you couldn't get many spectra onto. Uh, and you programmed it in Fortran and it was really tedious. And it would produce an hour. It, it, it would produce NR spectra um, from 1100 to 2500 nanometers in steps of two nanometers. So P701, because you've got the two ends of the it's lamp posts and gaps between them, it's um, 701 spectral points. Uh, and um, typically ends less than 100. When we, when we started using these things, it was still sort of 30 or 40 typically. Uh, so now we really do have the, the P bigger than N problem um, a long time ago. I mean, it's very fashionable now, but this was the 1980s. There were big data handling problems. Uh, the computers were rubbish. Uh, the data storage was fairly rubbish. Uh, and so doing anything was a real pain in the neck. The, the first calibrations, and interestingly, there were there were quite a lot of people working on the same problem. So back in the 1980s in the U in um, the UK, there were quite a lot of agricultural research institutes. Um, so there was a grassland research institute near Henley, near, near Maidenhead. Uh, there were a Scottish crop research institute um, somewhere up on the borders. 
um, Aberdeen University had an instrument and were working on those sorts of applications. So there was a lot of uh, collaboration and we were all struggling to try and find the right way to, to analyze these data. And obviously the early, um, the early approaches, you carry on doing what you know how to do, which is use multiple linear regression. You've got 700 variables, you can't use them. So let's chuck away 690 of them. Um, even though your research institute's just paid, just blown its entire equipment budget for the next year on buying an instrument that will give you all this data, you throw most of it away uh, in order to analyze it. Uh, and there was stepwise variable selection with quite a lot of user interaction. Uh, it wasn't uh, automatic. You would get graphs of correlations for the partial correlations for the next variable. Uh, and you could look at those and you could you could pick your variable either as the one giving the best correlation or using some um, spectroscopic knowledge about uh, this not only gives a good correlation but I understand where this variables come this wavelength is coming from um, and then principal component regression uh, but you have to reduce the dimensionality some somehow because you can't uh, well there are, there are two approaches one is reduced dimensionality uh, the other would be some sort of penalized regression. Uh, most of the approaches used were dimension reduction. Um, obviously, one way is to just do variable selection. Uh, the other is to construct some variables. And almost pretty much at the same time, two methods were suggested. Uh, one was principal component regression. So you take the spectral data, you do a principal component analysis on it, you discover that the correlations between the wavelengths are so high that um, maybe 20 PCs out of the 700 dimensions will actually capture 99.999 something percent of the variation uh, and therefore you're really not losing anything by throwing away the other uh, 680 dimensions and more or less the same time uh, slightly further north um, partially squares regression was invented uh, and that was also used and, and gave very similar results. I think in the early days, which you used depended on how far north you came from, uh, i.e. the UK was using uh, PCR for a while uh, and Scandinavia was using partial least squares. Uh, and in the end, um, the Vikings won uh, and we're now all using uh, partial least squares. And that had the advantage, it's a more sophisticated method in some sense but it's they're actually both pretty simple um, and computationally they're actually simpler than variable selection because the computers were rubbish the only way you could do variable selection effectively uh, was to do stepwise forward um, running a genetic algorithm or something would have been prohibitively time consuming um, I spent a lot of time programming something that would search all pairs so that you could start with the best pair rather than the best single variable. Uh, and that that had to run overnight. Uh, it was really very slow. Um, in some ways, var variable selection almost got discarded as a method early on uh, because it was computationally so hard to do anything um, very sophisticated. Uh, and it came back later when when computers got better. But it was sort of at that point in the 80s when we people had to analyze data like uh, so of the type that came from these uh, scanning instruments that the PLS took over uh, and it's it's been in charge uh, so ever since. So question from Ganesh on here, what was the criteria for removing features? Um, so it, it was In the variable selection, it was just stepwise forward selection. So you you pick, the, in the simplest form, you look at the correlations between single wavelengths and the thing you're trying to predict, and you pick the best wavelength. Uh, and then fixing that one, you look at the, the multiple correlations of the pair, including that one and any of the other 699. Uh, and you just step up like that until you've got um, uh, it, what you think is enough, which typically would be maybe less than 10. Uh, if, if you meant the um, PCR or the PLS, the, uh, i.e. how many factors do you choose? Initially, it was 
But in the PCR, it was just uh, let, let's take the number that explain a certain percentage of the variability uh, in the spectral data. Uh, and then later on, people started using things like cross-validation to optimize predict optimize um, cross-validation error by, by increasing numbers of PCR principal components or increasing numbers of PLS uh, factors. Uh, why did we move, Dana? Why did we move away from the ratio of derivatives? If Norris was getting great success with this R, we lost this by sticking data into a package and getting an answer. Uh, no, it's an interesting question. That I, th I think the reason we moved away from it basically is that there was a lot of Carl Norris in it. Um, so what you could do, and I don't know if anybody's tried to do it, is you could write software that would search over ratios of derivatives, I mean, over equations using ratios of derivatives, and possibly even search in, in a limited way over um, the window, for example, for a savitsky Uh And I'm a bit surprised that hasn't been followed up. People didn't do what Carl was doing in the early days, um, in, say, the 1980s, because nobody else could do it. Uh, because there was there was a lot of spectroscopic knowledge went into it and doing the searches automatically would have been quite prohibitive you'd have to be pretty careful when you program it in order to try and make sure you weren't sort of chasing tiny and getting more and more complicated chasing tiny improvements by by exhaustive searches but but it, it is a possible research area uh, and it 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 might really work quite well i don't know uh, yeah, machine. Yeah, you might you might do it by some sort of machine learning application. It it it, it is a possible research topic. Now. Okay, let's move on to the rest of history. Um, so the rest of history is less less interesting. Lots of copycat boxes. So lots of instruments that basically sort of did the same job. Um, there, there are a whole range of filter instruments with various numbers of filters in, and then other technologies that would give you the same sort of information. Uh, I guess the important, um, the developments that were not sort of um, incremental were, which, but which were, which sort of changed things a bit. Um, the ages before people have been making um, um, IR interferometers. So FTs, Fourier transform NIR. Um, and it's not very hard to adapt an IR interferometer to measure NIR as well. So uh, companies like Perkin Elmer and Brooker um, started producing FT NIR instruments. Uh, and they're pretty good, but fairly expensive, I think would be, <laughs> would be a brief summary. Um, a, another big change was uh, imaging cameras uh so you can now get uh, as many most of you will know you can now get take images where you've got uh, a spectrum either at a limited number of wavelengths multi-spectral or a whole nir spectrum hyperspectral uh image and and that presents its own um chemometric challenges which i'm not really going to talk about i think uh, and the other big development which i will talk about a, a bit later uh, is portable instruments. So um, the the lab the lab instrument market is what you might call mature. Um, the the portable instrument market is um, developing really very fast, and it's probably the most exciting bit uh, at the moment. And on the calibration front, um, machine learning became flavor of the month. Um, but with the flavor of the month changing, not every month, but every few years. Uh, so artificial neural networks were the the way to the way to do it for a while and then support vector machines and Gaussian process regression and random forests and you can fill in the dots for yourself so pretty well everything out of machine learning has been tried uh, on spectral data uh, and it all works if you're careful enough um, but uh, the majority of practical calibrations are still done by PLS. So another question in here, 
What about using penalized regression, rage, lasso to do dimension? Yes, it's been done. Um, you, you can you, you can you can use both of those, and and they do work. They do work. Um, lots of things work. Uh, it just well, I'll make some comments, uh, some more detailed comments on that later. And application spread out. So it started with food. Uh, it started with food because that, there was a big demand there. Um, the applications are now very wide. I've, I've missed a load off here, I'm sure. Um, but things, I've never worked in pharma, actually. I think pharmaceutical companies like to keep the data to themselves. Um, but the rest I have, so medicine, petrochemicals, environmental science, heritage science, that's where the paper comes from. Um, so pa paper's almost agriculture, it's, it's um, cellulose in there. Um, and when it degrades, it's because the long molecules in the cellulose break up. Uh, and you can measure that with an IR, not surprisingly. Um, and so there are applications, and there are, there are lots more applications. But food and ag is still a really big, important application area. And that's because there's a need, lots of, lots of stuff. Well, there's a need because there's enormous variability in the raw materials. They're, they're biological, um, and, and so they vary. Um, and you try and make your foodstuffs to be pretty constant in their properties. But what you're making them from uh, is intrinsically variable because it's grown. Uh, it lived once, it, it grew once, uh, and it's variable. And, and so you need to do a lot of measurements, uh, and you need to do it cheaply because there's not much profit in food, uh, and you need to do it rapidly, and that's NIR is ideal. And it's ideal also because of what you can easily measure in NIR. So, so the you see the overturns and combination bands from CHOH, NH, uh, bonds and, and they're exactly what you need to measure uh, in order to measure water, protein, starch, sugars, fat, uh, exactly the things you want to measure uh, in foodstuffs. So it's food food and eggs, the ideal application in many ways. Um, and, and that's why it's still and will continue to be a, a really important, a really important application of an IR. So where are we now? Um, I, said, I said I'd say a bit more about um, portable instruments. So there's a lot going on in this area. There are a lot of new instruments coming on the market all the time. They're getting smaller. They're not always getting better. Um, they're being marketed quite aggressively in some cases. Uh, and they're exciting because it means you can take these rapid measurements out of the lab, into the field, into the processing plant, into the warehouse, uh, even into the supermarket, even into your home as they get cheaper and cheaper. Uh, and there are some that are designed to be mounted on drones, flown, to, flown over crops um, to do what's called precision agriculture. So you don't chuck extra nitrogen on the entire field, you chuck extra nitrogen on the bits that seem like they need it because you can measure at least approximately the nitrogen content in the leaves on the plants. Um, and you can decide when to harvest things at optimal times as well. So there are lots of applications for, for portable instruments. Um, the one shown up, up on the top right of the screen is, is one that I've worked with. It's a VRV Micronear. Um, I, don't, I don't have any particular axe to grind for VRV. Um, it's a picture of it because I know that one works. Um, it's very small instrument. So think of it like a torch. Most of what you can see is the battery. Um, the instrument's just the bit, the, the bulbous bit on the end. So it's very, very small. Uh, and despite that, it gives reasonable quality spectra uh, over the ranges 900 to 1700 nanometers uh, in, in the case of this one. Um, it's got problems, or, or the, they've all got problems. Uh, you can see it's quite a small window. If you're going to have a small instrument, then it's only going to be able to look at a small amount of sample. But uh, you can move it, you can take multiple measurements very quickly. Uh, and in fact, with this one, you can move it around and it will average the measurement uh, as you move it around. So the application I was working with, um, we, we sort of moved it in a W shape over, over quite a large sample and it will average. And so you effectively get 
a bigger window than you would have got with a lab instrument, um, although it does require a bit of effort, obviously. Um, it's got a restricted spectral range. It's, this is only 900 to 1700, um, and there aren't many that go much higher than that um, because of issues, I think, with, with miniaturizing the, the, uh, the equipment and temperature control as well at, at higher wavelengths. Uh, it would be nice for foodstuffs to to have the wavelengths above just above 1700, which are really good for fat. Uh, it would be nice to have wavelengths in the 2000 nanometer region as well. Uh, you can you can measure moisture perfectly well in that range uh, and some other things, but would be nice to have a wider range. Um, and clearly, they're going to be lower quality spectra than you, you're going to get out of a, a Brooker FDNIR instrument mounted very carefully on the bench top uh, in humid in temperature and humidity control conditions. Um, but they're spectra you can live with um, and you can do perfectly good calibrations with them. Uh, and the potential is obviously enormous uh, because they're, well, they're not all cheap, but they're, they're a reasonable price. Um, and you can take them out into lots of places. And that one of the things that does is it means you can you can take a lot more samples, so you can do a lot more sampling. Um, when you take stuff into the lab, you tend to take a little sample and you take it into the lab and you take one measurement on it. If you're out there looking at a, a whole stack of animal feed, you can actually take a lot of measurements on that, that animal feed. And since most of the measurement variability is actually sampling variability and not, not analytical variability, um, that, that's a potential enormous improvement. Um, so there is a lot of potential here. Uh, so the question, how do you evaluate portable instruments from vendor A against vendor B? What are things to look out for? I'm not really an expert in that. I think, well, there are, there are practical considerations like um, what size is the window? Uh, what's the spectral range? What's the spectral resolution? How long does the battery last? How do you get the data out? Um, but there are one of the problems that a lot of them do have, and you'd have to borrow one to test that is stability. Um, so some of them are not very stable over time. Uh, and in particular, the temperature control on some isn't very good. So they would tend to eat up while they're working and, and then you sort of lose control of things and, and you get poor spectra. So I think you'd want, if you really want to do an evaluation, well, you either read a paper from somebody who's done it um, or you um, borrow one, borrow two uh, and actually try and do some calibrations on something fairly simple uh, and just see if it works. So where are we going? Um, as I said, the main trend, the main exciting developments are small, low cost and ion development devices, and they're being marketed directly at consumers. Um, and it, we're not far off uh, the, the sort of internet stuff around about people launching things that don't yet exist. Um, soon you'll be able to measure an ion spectrum with your mobile phone. Um, and it won't be all that long before you'll be able to do hyperspectral imaging on your mobile phone. Um, and that's going to lead to, well, there are already a number of problems. Um, there's lots of stuff on the internet, if you just search on these things, um, really saying how wonderful they are. You see people sitting at, standing up or sitting in discussions at conferences uh, saying how wonderful they are. Uh, and it's not always true. So some of the instruments aren't very good. Um, some of them actually don't exist. If, if you search, you'll find websites for instruments, which actually are really aimed at raising capital in order to produce the instruments. So it takes you a while to realize that this instrument doesn't exist yet. Um, it's a concept. And but some of the ones that do exist aren't very good. They're not stable. Um, they're very noisy. Um, and they're marketed with calibrations that don't work. Um, I think the calibrations tend to be even worse. There, there are loads of claims around which are just frankly not credible, um, partly because NIR doesn't measure parts per million, it measures percents. Um, something needs to be there in sort of percent levels before you're going to measure it. Uh, and so claiming to measure, for example, pesticide on fruit um, with a handheld device is just crazy. 
Uh, and on the whole, and I've put the on the whole in because there are exceptions, it measures things with NIR absorbances. So if somebody's claiming to measure something that doesn't have an NIR absorbance, um, they're probably telling fibs. Um, it's, it's on the whole because you can measure some things. Um, you can measure salt in some things, not because it's got a spectrum, but because it shifts the water spectrum around. So you can sort of measure some things with secondary effects. But on the whole, if it doesn't have an NIR absorbance, then uh, you might wonder how it's being measured. Uh, and I'm worried about these because there are going to be some failures, there are going to be some disasters, uh, there are going to be some very disappointed customers, uh, and there's a risk that it will discredit the whole area, um, that um, farmers, for example, will be unwilling to invest in cheap but perfectly, relatively cheap but, but perfectly good instruments because um, they've seen that there's a whole scandal about really cheap and rubbish instruments. Um, and there's another obvious problem, which before I go into it, I'll look at this question, just about to ask about stability. Uh, my experience, some other portable and the spectrum are not very stable, reproducible, even minute to minute with, without temperature. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think stability and in particular temperature stability are the problems that these instruments have. Um, there isn't room for, if you're going to make the thing very small, there isn't room for sophisticated temperature control. And if you don't have sophisticated temperature control, and especially if you're using it uh, all over the place, um, then uh, you may get instability. How's NIR different from VIS? What kind of traits NIR would focus? Um, it's different from VIS in that it's, it's, uh, wavelengths that are a bit closer to the infrared. Um, it's wavelengths that correspond to um, uh, vibrational spectroscopy absorbances in the infrared. And so it can enable, enable you to measure things that um, visible light won't uh, enable you to measure. Although a lot of spectrophotometers, especially a lot, lot of the lab instruments, have color, have the visible range in them as well. So a lot of a lot of the monochromators will do 400 to 2500 these days, uh, i.e., do visible as well. So it sort of it sort of blurs. I mean, it's the whole electromagnetic spectrum, and it's there. But you do get things in the NR that you, you don't get in invisible. So the other problem um, is what's going to happen when loads of people have these instruments. Um, so suppose most people have got an NR spectrophotometer on their phone, uh, then people are going to market all sorts of interesting apps. And one that might get mar marketed is for detecting melamine in powdered milk. Uh, so I don't know how many of you, how many, whether you know about this, there was a scandal not uh, a few years ago now, um, where in China, in particular, people were adding melamine to powdered milk. Uh, melamine's got a lot of nitrogen in it, uh, so in any analysis of the milk, it shows up as protein. Uh, and so you can increase the protein in your powdered milk very cheaply uh, by chucking a bit of melamine in. The, the problem is it's a carcinogen. Uh, it's toxic. Um, and there was a big scandal in, in China, uh, and babies died uh, as a result of that. And so people started trying to measure melamine using all sorts of methods, including NIR. And it, sort of, it works as long as there's a reasonable amount that, well, it works as long as we're not talking tiny amounts. Um, but suppose people have got these instruments on their, um, on their phones and somebody markets an app to do this. And suppose there isn't any. So the, the market's perfectly clean. There's no melamine. And the instrument's really good. So the, the chance of a false positive is only one in 100. Um, uh, none of the instruments are going to be that good. So now we imagine 10,000 people taking measurements. There are going to be about 100 positives, and, and they'll all be false positives. Um, so if a lot of people, I mean, it's obvious, but if a lot of people take measurements and there's a small chance of a false positive, you will get a lot of false positives. Uh, now you add reporting bias. The false positives will get reported. All those negatives that won't get reported. And the social media. And so somebody goes up. Uh, on Twitter saying, there's melamine in my milk. Everybody takes their mobile phone out, measures their milk, and quite a lot of them will get false positives, and they'll all go on Twitter as well. And, and you have an enormous problem. Um, 
and I don't know what the solution to that is. You can't stop people having the instruments. You can try and educate them. Um, so what they need is some basic probability theory, um, but uh, I'm not wildly optimistic we can do that. It's, it's a problem we ought to be worried about. Um, and I don't, I don't know what we do about it, but it's there and it's gonna happen. Uh, so how many more of these have I got looking at the time? Not very many. Um, so I may even finish on time. Um, so where are we now? Well, we're doing what Chemometrics is doing, what it's always done. Um, it, it looks at what the computer scientists were doing a couple of years ago, and you try it on NIR spectrum. So we've used all the things that came, come out of computer science. And I, I guess the, the current um, flavor of the month is deep learning because everybody's doing deep learning on everything. Um, and it can work uh, and it can also go wrong. Most working calibrations use, still use PLS uh, through, through all of this. Um, and that's because it's easily available. So it's available on lots of software. The instrument manufacturers put it, always put it on their software and it's relatively easy to use. Um, it's, it's quite hard to screw up um, and it works. Um, it's for anybody who's done research taking a new fancy method and trying it on an hour spectra and saying, well, I better compare this with PLS, uh, knows that PLS is surprisingly hard to beat. Um, you, can, you can always beat it, obviously, because if you do something more sophisticated and you tune it plenty, you can beat it. But beating it, beating it hollow is really quite hard. Uh, it's, it's pretty good. Um, and it produces, like unlike a lot of methods, it produces things that you can interpret, sometimes over-interpret, but it, it some, at least interpret. So uh, the pictures on the right are actually from, it's from another talk, uh, they're coefficient vectors from principal component regression and PLS regression uh, calibrations. Uh, it's actually on biscuit does. Um, anybody tell me what the well, anybody tell me what's being measured from looking at the spectrum? We must have some spectro food spectroscopists here. Fat, yes. Well done, Brendan. Uh, the, the, that double peak in the middle uh, is absolutely characteristic of, of fats, so about 1730. And so, um, and so if you're a spectroscopist and you're using PLS and you get a coefficient vector out, looks like this, and you know you're measuring fat, you can feel nice and warm and happy about it. Um, and it is reassuring to know that there might actually be some basis for the measurement you're taking. Um, so until some of these other methods produce similar diagnostics, produce things, and some of them do, uh, produce things, but some of them are black boxes, produce things that um, spectroscopists can interact with and understand, um, then uh, PLS is still going to be the attractive method. Uh, so comment here from Claudia, false positives, may advantage you that people have a chance to know about false positives now with rapid tests. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, and one of the things that's in the news at the moment is that when they're testing all these school children, most of whom don't have COVID, um, we're getting quite a lot of false positives. And uh, as, as the level of infection goes down in the population, uh, the proportion of positives that are false positives are going to go up. Uh, and somebody's going to have to try and explain that. Um, although at some point they'll stop because at the moment they're sending kids home from school because of a false positive. Wh which would be just like them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it, it's an education it's an educational problem that we need to tackle anyway, but, but it, it has implications for citizen science too. So here's a very brief history of chemometrics and NIR. I made this slide initially for a talk in Japan, which is why they're all Toyotas. Um, so the, the car analogies are, um, very, this is 1966 Toyota Corolla, MLR, Carl Norris, a 1980s Toyota Corolla, and that, that car's chosen because it is the most successful single car brand ever. Uh, I think more of those were built than anything else ever. Uh, and, or, or the name persisted for longer than anything else. I can't remember which. And, and PLS, due to Harold Martin's or the application, 
to NIR deuteral martins uh, is not dissimilar to MLR. It's a bit more sophisticated. It's probably a bit easier to drive, um, but it's basically similar. And, and my analogy for, for all these machine learning techniques would be something um, shiny and red and very fast. Um, and the obvious questions are, which is most fun? The answer's, obvious, the answer's clear, um, but which is safest? Uh, and if you had a learner driver, which one would you rather they started off with? Um, and, and I think that's, that's the sort of reason why uh, I think it's not bad that PLS continues to be the sort of workhorse, uh, continues to be what most people use as a default. Where are we going? Well, uh, my guess is that where we're headed, uh, and I don't like the look of it, um, is we're headed for a future where a lot of calibrations are done in the cloud uh, by artificial intelligence algorithms uh, with little or no human supervision. People upload data to the cloud, um, some algorithm does the calibration, downloads it, and people use it. Um, and my car analogy is, is a driverless car. Uh, and there's a bent driverless car uh, without any name to it because I don't want to be sued. Um, but you all know what brand it is. Uh, and I'm sure that driverless cars are the future. And, and I'm sure eventually they will be a lot safer um, than cars with drivers in, because most accidents are caused by driver error. Um, and in principle, automatic calibration methods could be a lot safer than ones that involve human interaction because people don't get to make a mess of it. Uh, but we're a long way from that yet. Um, and my worry, I think, is that we'll, we'll move to doing that while we're still a long way from it. And there will be some rubbish calibrations produced by poor data uploaded, uploaded to the cloud and treated by algorithms that don't actually know what they're doing and don't know anything about spectroscopy. So some concluding remarks. Um, I'm sorry if the, the many of the later remarks seem like grumpy old man um, and a bit pessimistic. I'm, I'm, I'm not a Luddite. I'm, I'm not against new calibration methodology. Uh, I'm just against its misuse. So one example where somebody's, somebody's used non-PLS methods is, is FOSS, the instrument company. They've been using neural nets for ages um, and they've been doing, had great success with it. But um, they, they do it in-house, they have very large training sets and they know what they're doing. Um, and it's not somebody uh, in a small company developing their own calibration uh, using really quite sophisticated methods without knowing what they're doing. And I wouldn't want to discourage anybody from researching new calibration methods. We need, we need the research. But what I would put in a, a plea for is to encourage people to be realistic about the claims being made. I see lots of papers for um, spectroscopy and chemistry journals, which are basically people taking a machine learning method uh, and struggling to get it to do a tiny bit better than PLS. And if you did a significance test on the mean squared error, you really wouldn't find a difference. Uh, and then claiming it's much better. And, and amazingly, sometimes claiming it's simpler when it, when it took them a fortnight to do that and probably five minutes to do the, the PLS calibration. So by all means do it, but, but please be realistic about what you're claiming. And, and please think about, worry about the interpret, interpretability. If you want to sell your method, uh, it's going to sell a lot easier if the chemists can understand, at least think they understand what's going on, at least see some pictures that suggest they might understand what's going on. Uh, and I'd be happy to argue with people who are less pessimistic than me. Thanks. Thank you, Tom, for your really, really interesting talk. We have 15 minutes for question uh, from the audience. If you want, you can write them in the chat or you can try to raise your, virtually raise your hand and, and I can try to. I, I, I am going to start with one actually. And uh, no, there's Claire. Okay, no. Uh, Claudia, yeah. oh no, sorry. That's Claire, yeah. Hi, Claire. Tom. 
Uh, thanks very much. Um, it was a wonderful uh, walk through uh, your many years of, of work in this area. Um, I also really like, I've, I've scribbled down several of your lines here, um, but I, I think the key one is um, against the misuse of, of um, these uh, sort of more advanced methods and, and just being cognizant of, of what's actually going on under the hood. I think that's a really clear uh, safety message. Um, could I ask about um, your view on, on other fields that we should be looking towards to see what's going on there um, in, in terms of spectroscopy? So you mentioned things like pharma and other places where, you know, these sorts of, of data sets are analysed and used. Um, and I sometimes worry that we're, you know, reading the same literature all the time. And, and is there other stuff going on out there that, that we should be looking to and, and being cognizant of? The answer is I'm not sure. What, what you see... What you see in the literature, even if it's general literature, is still a lot of food applications. Um, I think that's one of the reasons for that is that people tend to be more open, I think, about food applications, maybe because a lot of them are going in, on in research institutes and universities. Uh, whereas the pharma research and the petrochemical research tends to be going on in-house within um, pharmaceutical companies within oil companies uh, and on the whole they don't like sharing their results with the other pharmaceutical companies the other oil companies so it's partly I think about about secrecy um, yeah I, I think it is you, you go to a, you go to a conference and you look at the posters um, when you used to be able to go to conferences and look at posters um, and despite the fact it's completely general in our conference, 80-90% of them are on food applications. And and I think it's it's just partly about secrecy. So I, I don't know what the pharma companies are doing. Um, and I don't know, I know a bit about what the petrochemical people are doing because they publish some of it, but, but, but no, I'm sure there are interesting things out there, but they're hidden a lot of them. Mm -hmm. okay. Reassuring, thanks, Tom. So, a question from Donna in the chat is asking what in your opinion is the best strategy to identify samples for, for inclusion or reference data set and how do you know if you have enough? Uh, golly that's that's a very difficult one in, in it's like the standard question for a statistician is uh, how, how many replicas do I need <laughs> and that's a very hard one to answer. Um, You should, I mean, the, the standard advice is that what you need to do is have enough samples to cover the variability in the population that you're going to be predicting for. And that's not just variability in the thing you're going to predict, but variability in all the sorts of things that might interfere with that prediction. So the ideal calibration set is a simple random sample from all the samples you're ever going to analyze in the future. And that's clearly not possible. Um, so you need to think about those samples and you need to get enough samples in your, your calibration set to represent those. And by the time you've done that, you've got enough, basically, uh, I think. Yeah, there's another question about like the cost. Of, of, yeah. Is it, when you say small samples, do you mean a small number of samples? Yeah, it's a yeah, yeah, okay. So, yes, it's it's not uncommon to have a small number of samples. Um, the expense comes not from taking... To do a calibration, you need reference measurements and you need NIR measurements. Typically, the NIR measurements are very cheap, uh, which is why you're trying to develop the calibration in the first place. And the reference measurements often might be quite expensive. Uh, and so the limitation on... Um, sample size, uh, sizes of training set is, is typically the number of reference, the amount of reference chemistry you can afford. Th there are some ways around that. You can, um, you can measure, if you can get hold of a lot of samples, but you can't afford to analyze them, then you can measure the spectra of all of those samples um, and then use various algorithms, Kennard Stone's the, the most common one, to choose samples that span the, the space of spectral variability. 
uh, and then just do the reference analysis uh, on those. So if you've got a, if the if the limitation is you can't afford the reference chemistry, there, there are ways you can sort of come back, uh, you can sort of um, cope with that a bit. Um, but it it can be it can be quite difficult to get enough samples. But there are other cases where it's difficult to get the right samples. So what I have seen of farmer applications, of often the ideas, uh, quality control. Um, and so you, you, you want rapid method of detecting tablets that are out of spec. But of course you don't make tablets that are out of spec. Um, and if you're, if you're running a production process and you've got the FDA on your back, you absolutely do not want to change it to produce tablets that are out of spec. Um, so you tend to have to make up the out of spec tablets separately with the hand press and whatever, and then they don't look like the other tablets. And so sometimes just getting the right samples can, can be a, a big deal. Um, so I've got a question about Ridge and Lasso, and then uh, Claire's going to answer it later, which <laughs> which saves me the trouble, I think. Uh, oh, but says we're interested to hear um, Tom's. Tom, um, I haven't done a lot of that. I, I suspect that. Um, so shrinkage, pen, penalization methods, shrinkage methods will, will also work perfectly well. Um, and so one could, I'm sure you could use Ridge, I'm sure you could use Lasso uh, to either just penalize or to um, select variables in the, in the case of Lasso. And, and people have done that. I know that... Um, an, an ex PhD student of mine who's currently in Singapore, Ying Ju, uh, has been doing some stuff with um, Lasso uh, on NIR calibrations for um, Chinese traditional medicines. Um, so, yeah, pe people, people are using that. Uh, there's a couple more questions which I can't see because they're running off. So error of prediction obviously includes statistical error, but also instrument, operator error, temperature. Any, uh, any idea how to distinguish? In other words, only validate predictions on samples that were properly taken. So the, the usual way, and, and I suspect most people pay lip service to it rather than actually do it, is that you can obviously look at whether the spectrum of the sample that you're about to predict looks like the 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 distribute the spectra of the samples in the in the training set um, and you can do that by um, things like Mahanobis distance things like plotting them in PC space you could use the Mahanobis distance on PCs or on or on PLS factors and just if it's more than a certain distance then maybe you should worry about it so yeah, there are, there are standard ways to do it. I suspect most people don't do it most of the time. Brendan, other extra different other issues to consider when doing classification instead of calibration? Um, yeah. Yes, well, there, there are some, I mean, obviously it's a similar problem and indeed you can make the classification into a regression problem. Um, I think, one issue is you have to be even more rigorous about how you validate um, because it's really it's really easy to overtune a classification by by fudging boundaries around so <laughs> the things near the boundaries suddenly end up on the right side of them uh, and and so separate independent validation is always important but it's absolutely important uh, in classification um, and, and also and something else that I've found looking at papers where people do classification is um, it's also quite important to get a training set that actually represents the natural variability in, in all sorts of things in, in the samples you're going to classify in future. Somehow people who would be quite careful if they're to, to represent the future population when they're doing a, a quantitative calibration suddenly lose the whole idea when they do something, uh, do a classification. Uh, so they get um, 
trying to think. I think the worst the worst example I ever saw, and I can't remember who did it. So, um, and it was it was a classification model for bottled water, um, and so they were distinguishing different supermarket brands of bottled water, um, and they're really very successful classification. You, you it was. 100% success. And when you look at their experimental design, there were actually three bottles of bottled water in this whole experiment, one of each type. Uh, and and the, the 50 samples they had in each population were subsamples out of the same bottle. And it's not surprising it worked. You may, you may have been able to separate two bottles of Perrier. I don't know. It's quite possible. Um, so I think experimental design becomes much more important. Uh, and, and as I say, people seem to just lose them lose it when it comes to, to classification and don't design properly. Uh, I think we have time for, like, we have five minutes less. We have so a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah there's so, Jorge asking if not using black box would uh, be useful for interpretation. Just a moment, let me, let me see if I can get back up to that one. Yeah, uh, yes, ab absolutely. I mean, one thing to be said for wavelength selection, as long as you end up with wavelengths you understand, is, is that it, it's likely to give you a calibration that you understand. Um, and I think I think that's that's a big advantage for it. Obviously, you can also try and understand PLS calibrations. Um, the ones that worry me are the ones where the entire thing's inside a black box and you don't know why it's working. Um, and things can work by accident and so when when an hour calibrations work and you don't know why you should always be extremely worried uh, that they might stop working uh and we almost out of time uh yeah they keep disappearing off the top does claudia that would like to have an example about classification she could play yeah. Unmute herself if you want. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, far away. <laughs> um, so I was, I was thinking uh, when I was working in in research about um, clinical diagnostics, tumor diagnostics. Uh, we had a lot of discussion about that because this is all uh, very much classification problems. And uh, what tended to happen there was that people that is spectroscopists were worried about the, the references, basically pathologists um, not agreeing on what the sample is in, in terms of the class label. And what would happen is that people would exclude all the samples where the pathologists did not agree. And this creates an artificially easy problem to classify. And this, uh, this was also used for the validation. And actually people make claims that their methods are better than pathologists because there are studies out saying that pathologists are not in agreement or wrong every so often. But in the end, you couldn't conclude it from the data because they excluded everything that was not, let's say a textbook case of, a, of their, um, the tissues they were looking at. And I think similar problems tend to happen with lots of, classification setups where the, the reference labels are somehow not as certain as one would think, uh, thinking that it's a classification problem, because I think lots of classification problems are maybe re regressions in disguise from a chemical point of view. So concentrations come in, well, as metric variable, basically, and we think things are classes and, and well separated, but often they're not that well separated when it comes to biological things. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree very much with the last comment. I, I've lost count of the number of times people have brought to me what they have treating as a classification problem. And I said, it's not a classification problem. Why have you taken a continuous variable and thrown away nearly all the information in it? Um, and do, do a Calibration. I mean, do a quantitative calibration. If you want to put a threshold on it later, then fine. But but why chuck the information away? Um, and I, th I think I know why. Uh, because then you don't have to reveal the the root mean squared error. You you chuck out a few borderline samples, and you get very good classification statistics. Um, but that's me being cynical again. Okay, I think we really are up against the time.
Yeah, I don't know if you if you want to, to answer in the chat to someone the other question while we go on with the workshop, it's fine. Yep, yeah, yeah, okay. So, so sorry about that. We are running out of time. So thank you again, Tom. It was really, really interesting. Thank you for your talk.